Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayla Rogers, and I'm an Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Women's Fund. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this wonderful presentation. This is the final presentation for our Holiday Stress Awareness Series for the month of December. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Women's Fund, we are a nonprofit located in Houston, Texas, and our mission is to provide women and girls with the tools they need to be advocates for their health. So we do this through focus seminars like today's presentation, as well as curriculum-based classes and publications. All of our classes and publications are completely free. I encourage that you visit our website, thewomensfund.org, where you can find free PDF versions of our publications, or you can fill out a publication request form to request physical copies as well. Today, we are very honored to have um, Lauren Persley from the uh, Mental Health America of Greater Houston to present over self-care and burnout. So a little about Lauren. She is the training specialist at Mental Health America of Greater Houston, where she trains educators and community members on mental health literacy, integrated healthcare, and school behavioral health with the goal of destigmatizing mental illness across all communities. Lauren has developed trainings on educator self-care strategies, burnout and self-care, as we're going to cover today, and postpartum disorders. Lauren further instructs participants on the signs and symptoms of mental illness, trauma effects and reduction strategies, and youth suicide prevention. Currently, she is developing trainings on the effects of grief, mental health 101 for specific professions, including real estate and law, as well as teen mental health. As a certified instructor of mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid, Lauren has taught hundreds of participants in an internationally recognized and validated program designed to teach participants how to respond to mental illness and substance use. She has trained over 5,000 participants over her five years as an educator, including those throughout the Gulf Coast region in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. In partnership with UNICEF, Lauren instructed educators in Puerto Rico post-Hurricane Maria on trauma and mindfulness. Prior to her work at Mental Health America of Greater Houston, Lauren worked at a residential treatment center for mentally ill adults and has worked in permanent supportive housing housing and case managing formerly homeless clients. Lauren has a bachelor's in social work from Texas State University and is currently completing coursework in a teaching adult learners certificate from the University of California, San Diego. So we are so honored to have you here today, Lauren. We are really looking forward to this presentation. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here today and I'm, I'm very excited to be talking to you guys about burnout and self-care. So today, just to kind of let you know where we're going to be going over the next little bit, we're going to talk about what burnout is, uh, what are the risks of burnout, and how can we be affected by this, and also what it looks like, because it's going to look different for each of us. Uh, we're also going to talk about the difference between self-care and self-compassion, and we're going to talk about ways to decrease our burnout while increasing and maintaining our balance. But before we get started, I want to make sure we have a couple of group agreements. Um, as, uh, as we know, this is an incredibly stressful time. And if at any point you need to take a break to either take care of yourself or to take care of your needs, please feel free to do that. Um, if at any point you're taking a break, though, because you're feeling upset, um, please check in with me. Please feel free to privately message me. And then that way I can check in with you later and make sure that you're getting the, the care that you need. We want to really make sure that we're taking care of each other today. To that end, if people want to share uh, what is happening with them personally or something that they are working with personally, we are gonna ask for confidentiality today. Um, even though we are all in different rooms, we're gonna treat this as one sacred space and we're going to make sure and protect each other's confidentiality today. Um, but first and foremost, I kinda wanna make sure that we are all on the same page. So to that end, what is burnout? Burnout is specific to work-related stress. Um, it's a state or a physical or emotional exhaustion that involves a sense of reduced accomplishment and a loss of personal identity. 
this is really important for us to be talking about specific to 2020 and specific to the holidays. We know um, that in the best of years, the best of times, uh, the holidays can be incredibly stressful, um, specifically to uh, those of us, I'm a mom, uh, to those of us who, are, who have family, the, to those of us who have various family traditions. Um, the holidays can be incredibly stressful in and of themselves. And then this year, we're adding things to them that we've never had to do before. So that's very important for us to keep in mind as we go forward through the tail end of this year. But I wanna talk about what can cause burnout. Number one thing, having a high workload. Um, and it's important for us to be talking about this because we know that work-life balance is incredibly hard to maintain right now, especially when many of us are working from home. If you could, I would like to see by reaction, if you are working from home or you're able to work from home, can I get a thumbs up reaction? Um, okay, I see one thumb, two thumb, okay. So that helps me understand where we're kind of all coming from. Now, personally, I'm working from home. My husband's able to work from home and we are also taking care of a 15 month old toddler at home. Um, so that is also adding to potential a difficulty in the work-life balance. Um, having a control in our, or lack of control in our profession, which most professions at this point in time do have a lack of control. And then those of us who are in helping professions, I myself have a background in social work, and it's important for us to understand that those helping professions, whether it be first responders, frontline workers, there is an intense amount of strain right now. But let's also think about helping professionals as retail workers, as grocery store workers, as um, those people who are helping keeping things going right now. Um, when we have unclear expectations and when we have dysfunctional workplace dynamics, this is obviously going to increase burnout because it's going to be more difficult to communicate. And then when we have those extremes of activity, I know personally, there is generally a season to training, especially um, with educators. We usually train a lot in July and August and taper off throughout the rest of the semester. There are definitely ups and downs in activity. And it's important for us to be able to know those and predict them. And then when we have a lack of support, either as team members um, working together, but also when we have a lack of social support, either in our communities and then also in our families, these can all increase our burnout. Now, these are all questions to keep in mind, and I'm not going to ask anybody to answer them uh, because these are incredibly personal. But I want, these are all very important questions to be asking to assess yourself for burnout. Um, and these are important things that only we can individually assess. Um, all I will say is that if you are answering yes to one or more of these, we definitely need to be digging deeper. So I'm gonna give you guys a second to look these over and ask yourself if you are experiencing any of these. Again, we're not asking anybody to share um, if they do not want to. You know, and it's important for us to be checking in on this, not only in our health as, as employees, but also we have to understand that right now we are going through a global traumatic event. It is important for us to understand that there has not been a global traumatic event to this extent, at least since the 1917 the Spanish influenza. And we have very limited research on the impact of mental health. We have to understand that we don't have an idea of how this is going to impact our mental health long term. And so that is why it is incredibly important, even in the midst of these things, that we are checking in with ourselves and we are making sure to communicate what is happening. Now, we understand that burnout is is not an ideal but we have to understand the actual effects uh, burnout is incredibly costly not only to our own health but to the economy um, now some effects of burnout that we have to keep in mind is one when we have that change in mood and change in energy 
Um, change in mood and change in energy are two of the biggest indicators of mental health issues um, across the board. Those are the two things that I would look at the most. Um, those would be the key indicators that somebody might have a mental health issue in my mind. And these are things to also look for if somebody is burnt out, whether it's they're having difficulty sleeping, whether they're having a change in energy, whether they're having change in appetite. Um, but we also need to look at our substance misuse. Um, I saw a study that 50% of parents have reported higher use of substances since quarantine started. That's something that is going to come back at some point. We're going to have to be paying attention to that. Um, and then we also have to pay attention to our health risks. Burnout has been shown to cause either higher rates of health disease, um, higher heart disease, I'm sorry, higher rates of type 2 diabetes, higher rates of high blood pressure, and then there is an increased vulnerability to illness, which during a pandemic is incredibly difficult to deal with. We have to be paying attention to our overall health. So these are just some other statistics about burnout and the effects thereof. Keep in mind, these studies and this statistic is from 2017, which is the most recent data that we have. But I want you to just take a second and look at this and tell me in the, in the chat, uh, tell me which of these stats really jumps out at you. Or if uh, none of them jump at you, or what any of these are surprising to you. All right, go ahead and look at these and then tell me in the chat if any of these are surprising to you. Okay, the one that always jumps out at me is the one in five. Say that their performance is managed in a way that motivates them to do outstanding work. So 20%. That means that 80% of staff are saying that they are not being managed in a way that motivates them. That's important for us to be talking about. We, we all have different languages. We all have different things that motivate us. And it's important that us as employees are able to communicate that to our superiors. Um, let me see here. Okay, the one that jumped out uh, is uh, that one in three people are engaged in their work. Absolutely. Which means that two thirds of the populace are not engaged in the work that they're doing, at least according to this Gallup study. Um, thank you so much. So if we understand that this is an issue, what do we do about it? The number one thing that we can do as both employees and those in power, but also as communities and as women, is we've got to practice self-care. And it's really important that we take a second to figure out what is self-care and what it is not. Okay. Now, we've spent a lot of time probably since the quarantine began talking about self-care. And I want to make sure we're on the same page here today. Self-care is about looking after your mental health and well-being so that you can take care of the people around you. It's important for us to understand that self-care is not a luxury, okay? It's not selfish. And unfortunately, it is not simply massages and bubble baths. Don't get me wrong, I love a good bubble bath, but self-care is far more complicated than that. Self-care is not always pretty. And that's a conversation that we, we kind of stay away from sometimes. So I want to really make sure and we're being um, as transparent as possible. Self-care is about doing the things you need to do to be the best version of yourself. Okay, so let's think about this. For example, I, uh, one of my responsibilities in my household is doing the dishes, right? I don't particularly like doing the dishes, but I know that my mental health and well-being is far improved when I do the dishes at night and I wake up in the morning and the kitchen is clean and it is glistening and it's got that oh effect. Yes, that is something that makes me a better version of myself. Okay, putting away my laundry is something that makes me a better version of myself. These are th things that I don't particularly enjoy doing, but it is something that makes me feel better. 
And so that's kind of something that I want to put to you guys right now. We're in, we're in kind of a small group. So if you want to unmute yourself um, and answer these questions, that's perfectly fine with me. But I would like to take this opportunity uh, to potentially work through some issues. So if somebody here would like to share a story about a task um, that you have been putting off, a task that you have been putting off that you could um, finish easily. Um, so something that you have been putting off um, that you could finish easily that you would like to share with the group. Doing my laundry. <laughs> okay. How long have you been putting it off? It's been like a couple weeks now. <laughs> And how much time would you say that you've put into thinking about it? Uh, I think about it more than once a day. Usually when I go to grab something and I can't wear it or it's not there because it's dirty. Right. Okay. So you, you think about it about once a day. How long do you think it would take you to catch up on it? Uh, probably a few hours. Okay. Would you say that you've thought about it more than you it would take to uh, complete this task? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. And you know what? I completely understand. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, this, is, this is something we do. We build up tasks in our head. Um, the thing, going back to dishes, I know for a fact that even when my kitchen is wrecked, even when my kitchen is wrecked, it takes me 20 minutes to clean it top to bottom, because I, I have a system, right? I know that if I think about it and sit there and stew, I'm gonna spend a lot longer than 20 minutes in my mind. So let's think about that. Let's think about how long things actually take and see if we can take something off our list. I want you to think to yourselves, if there's something that you've been putting off, is there a way that you can take that off your list in the next few days? Um, and it, it can be something as simple as laundry. It can be something as simple as doing the dishes. But that those little things do add up. Um, now I'm going to open it back up to the group. Does anybody have a story or an example they want to tell about a boundary that they've set, something that they have um, gotten really good at, or a time in their life when potentially they should have set a boundary and by not doing so it made life more complicated? Uh, so something around the idea of boundaries. And if not, I can share, but if I'd love to hear from you guys. Well, I think one thing that I haven't put a boundary on, and it was a very difficult one to do, is mm -hmm. with family members who aren't respectful, especially during the holidays. Yes. And I've just cut them completely out of the celebration because they steal my joy. Yes. No, and absolutely. it's hard doing that because people make you feel guilty sure no and I, but i think i think that's especially important setting boundaries with family is hard um because you know there's there's just so many things going on there but it, the thing i i've come to understand about boundaries is it's not only teaching somebody how they cannot treat you but it's also treating them or teaching people that they can trust um, so you can trust that I'm not going to allow you to disrespect my holidays or I'm not going to let you to risk disrespect my joy. Right. But you can also trust that, you know, I am going to do what I say I'm going to do. I am going to be uh, caring. I'm going to be empathetic. Um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind as well. Um, so thank you for sharing. Does anybody want to potentially share an example of a time either they asked for help and what happened thereof, or if you had difficulty asking for help and how that has made life um, more or less complicated. Well, I guess I'll go again. Okay. It's such a shy group. I am a perfectionist. Everything has a place and I have this vision. So it's very, very difficult for me to ask for help because I may not want the macaroni salad for my Christmas dinner. And I, you know, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings otherwise. So, 
So I tend to not ask for help. Okay. Do it all. And I try not to be the martyr, but sometimes the martyr comes through. Hey, I completely understand that. I think, I think it's okay to have things that we're very particular on. I think it's just important for us to understand where our limits are. Um, you know, again, I live with a toddler, so I am very much becoming a prescriber of choosing my battles. Um, because again, she's my kid, so she's stubborn. Like it, it's karma. But it's important for us to recognize asking for help as a way to build relationships. And what I mean by that is when we, when we become vulnerable with somebody, when we, when we make a request, when we make an admission of I can't do something, it allows us an opportunity for connection. So by all means, like I think, I think I am very much a believer in having everything in its place and doing things a certain way. But if you can over this Yule season or the holidays, however you celebrate them, find something that you can delegate to somebody else and find it. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything major, but something that you can give to somebody else and allow them to take from you because it's, it's going to allow a connection. Um, and I think that can be something that, that can be really positive in our lives. Um, and then the last one, does anybody have difficulty telling people no? And these can be professionally or this can be personally. I used to have this job where my employer would call me on every day off that I had to come into work. And a lot of the times I would go in because yeah. I was in college and needed money and it just ran me completely ragged. And so now I have less problems saying no, but um, I definitely struggled with that. <clears throat> Absolutely. No, thank you for sharing. Oh, and yes, I love that, Jenny. Um, so absolutely, I have found, especially during quarantine, the freedom of a qualified yes. Yes, but. Yes, but I'm going to need a little bit more time. Yes, but I need to be able to do that tomorrow. Yes, but I'm going to need to be able to do it like this. Or yes, tomorrow. That is so important right now to give ourselves that grace because if somebody needs something emergently and if somebody needs something to be done exactly the way they need it, then at this point in time, I need them to be able to take that. Um, it's okay to be protective of our time and it's okay to be protective of our energy right now. Um, so being very open and if we're people like, well, obviously we're caring people, we, we want to help others. It can be very tricky to say no, especially if you're in a situation like you mentioned of, of needing employment. So find those ways that we can protect ourselves, I think is very important. Um, and, and really taking that opportunity to make sure that we are protecting not only ourselves, but our families. Um, you know, for example, I've got family members who aren't exactly following mask protocols right now. And so we're having to have pretty difficult conversations about um, holidays and things of that nature. And, you know, it has to come back to safety. Um, and so, you know, living with a toddler, I'm used to the idea of potentially um, choosing battles and choosing what, what works best for me. But it also is about understanding where those boundaries are and where we cannot cross. And it's all about safety, right? So as we're talking about this, I also want to bring to your attention the idea of self-compassion. Now, self-compassion is a little bit different from self-care in that it's about acting the same way towards yourself when we fail, when we make a mistake, as we do towards other people. I can guarantee that most of the people on this line have had conversations, have had an inner monologue with themselves that they would never say to anybody else, at least speaking for myself. And so self-compassion is all about being kind to ourselves versus being judgmental. It's about understanding our common humanity, understanding that if there's 8 billion people on the planet, 
there's a very good chance that there's somebody else out there going through something similar as me. And if I can have compassion for them, I have to have compassion for myself. It's also about having mindfulness. The idea of I have angry thoughts, not I am angry. The idea of taking a step back from our emotion. Now, all of this to say is this is incredibly tricky and this is not easy, but it is important that we make this work, especially while we're in these trying times. Knowing all of this, how do we possibly begin to decrease this burnout, especially understanding that we're in a global traumatic event? The first thing we can do is whether, and it says talk to your supervisor, but I'm going to go ahead and give a blanket statement of we have to be gut-wrenchingly honest and communicative right now. It's driving my husband to distraction because I'm talking to him all the time about what are our feelings, what are our emotions, because it's so important that we remain checked in. To that end, it's so important that we seek support, um, whether that's FaceTiming with our family members and friends, whether that's using employee assistance programs, whatever that looks like to you, make sure that you are connecting with others. And here I say connect, <clears throat> excuse me, and engage in a healthy lifestyle. Now keep in mind, this is incredibly vague and it's incredibly vague for a reason. I do not know what combination of movement, hydration, and sleep makes you the best version of yourself. It's important for us to be incredibly honest. We need to be in understanding of what works for us. Some people need eight hours of sleep in a row. Some people need five hours of sleep and a nap in the afternoon. It, that's okay. I think especially right now, given the kind of context of where we are as a society, I think it's time we stop kind of fitting ourselves into molds and start doing exactly what works for us. So. When I say exercise, I want you to think about play. I want you to think about that thing that you did when your mom would kick you out of the house on Saturdays and she would clean the house, okay? That's what I want you to think about when I think about exercise. Um, oh man, sorry. Uh, I just saw a comment about hiring a babysitter to take a nap. Um, my, my husband and I trade off on nap times, that helps. but. It's important for us to find those things that help us connect to the size of joy. So whether that's playing, whether that's you know, eating foods that make us happy and make us feel good, um, whether that's getting enough sleep, it's about finding those things that bring us that happiness. Now, I do wanna take a second to talk about SMART goals. This is a way to build goals and help us uh, achieve them. This, this is actually evidence-based that shows that we are, uh, you're more likely to achieve a goal when it is a SMART goal as opposed to other. Um, so I'm just going to go over this very quickly. And if you'd like to know more, I'm, I'm happy to give you my contact information and, and kind of talk about this in more broad detail. But a SMART goal has to be specific, okay? It can't just be, say, I want to drink more water. It has to be I want to drink 100 ounces of water every day for a month. Um, it has to have actual tangible details. So what I wanna challenge you to do is I wanna give you guys a couple of minutes here to kind of take a second and think, what is one thing, and it could, it could have to do with diet or exercise or sleep or hydration, but what's one thing that I could do for the next 30 days that would dramatically improve my self-care? Okay, so again, it's gotta be specific. It's gotta be measurable. And right now I would not focus on anything longer than 30 days. Um, and I wouldn't try it. Obviously we wanna be as healthful as possible. We wanna be as intentional as possible, but I'm going to be very you know, cognizant of the fact that right now it is again, due to trauma. It is incredibly difficult for us to convince our bodies um, that they need less. So weight loss is an incredibly difficult goal right now, um, where it is already a very difficult goal. So I'm just going to go put that, um, 
um, out there, but I want you to kind of think about what is a good goal for the next 30 days um, that could do with your hydration, movement, or sleep. And think about how could that impact our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so just take a second to think about that. And as you're thinking about that, I want us to kind of take a deep breath because I want to go and talk about mindfulness here. So, okay, so if I could, oh yes, Linda, that is a lovely goal. Uh, walk for 30 minutes, three and four times per week for the next 30 days. That's a great goal. Um, now, Linda, I don't mean to call you out, but how many times a week are you walking now? <clears throat> Okay, you're not working. That's cool. Fantastic. So for the next 30 days, given the kind of everything that we're going through, I think that I think walking is a great goal. I would not make a goal for more than one time a week for right now. Um, and when you do that, that's great. It's wonderful. It's an easy win. But if you're not doing it now, I would I would start with one to two times instead of three to four. But other than that, perfect goal. Um, okay, sorry about that. All right, I like that. Practice yoga 10 minutes a day for the next 30 days. That's great. And also same thing, if you're not currently doing yoga, 10 minutes is a great place to start. If you are, um, you know, daily is a great place to start as well. So it's, it's all about finding where are you now and then starting very close up to that. Um, so just thinking about those, those easy wins, those, those nice goals that we can start with. Now, here we go. Ooh, read a good book for 20 minutes. I don't usually read. Okay, so find something. If, if reading is something that you're more interested in doing, but you haven't really built a habit around, um, maybe audio books or, or things of that nature could be, or podcasts can be a nice stepping stone. Um, that's something that I have found. Um, schedule 30 minutes a day of gartering. I think those are all great. Um, I have been working on drinking enough water, as you could see throughout this training, um, partially because I'm, I'm constantly running between training and, and dealing with a toddler and I forget to drink water. Uh, but that is something I've been constantly kind of working on and I hope uh, to do better on. Now I do kind of want, oh yay, I, I love the idea of journaling uh, once a week. That's a great idea. Um, I do want to kind of bring you guys attention to the idea of mindfulness. If I could get some reactions, if you want to give me a thumbs up or whatever your other favorite reaction is, um, if you have heard of mindfulness, practice mindfulness, um, or at any point have, have been exposed to it. Okay, I see one thumb, two thumbs. Okay, fantastic. Okay, several thumbs. Okay, so for those who haven't, just to make sure we're on the same page. It's about being in this present moment, right? It's training the mind to be here and now. But it's not just being present. We have to have an attitude of openness, honesty, curiosity, and kindness. So as the person who taught me mindfulness says, we practice mindfulness when we're driving in traffic and the person in front of us cuts us off. And our first reaction is, I hope they're okay. You know what? I've cut people off in traffic too, and it's not great. And you hope wherever they're going that they're okay. That's what mindfulness is all about. And you know what? That is not easy, especially in Houston. It is not easy to be a mindful driver. So we practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is not something that you are going to get good at. That is a very Western attitude. There are going to be days where you're very able to be present in the here and now. There are going to be days where you cannot turn off your brain and that's okay, all right? So what I want to invite you to do, and notice I say invite because you can turn down an invitation, is I would like you to practice, uh, do a very quick breathing activity with me. We're only gonna take three deep breaths and then I'm going to explain the science behind why this is going to do what it's going to do. So if you would like to join me in this mindful breathing exercise, what I would ask you to do is to sit up 
um, if you want to place your feet flat on the floor. All right, and then once you do that, you can either put your hands in your lap or down by your sides, whatever's more comfortable for you. So we're going to take three deep breaths. And we're going to, when we breathe mindfully, we're going to inhale through our nose, like we are smelling flowers. We're gonna hold, and then we're gonna exhale through our mouths like we're blowing bubbles. All right, we're gonna do this three times. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna walk you through the steps, so just follow my lead, okay? All right, inhale. Hold. Exhale. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. One more. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. I want you to breathe naturally, however that is for you. Okay, and tell me, if you would like, give me a reaction or tell me something in the chat or unmute yourself and tell me how that was. I'm seeing some thumbs, I like that. So here's the thing. That's lovely, I'm so glad you guys feel calm. So here's the trick. Human beings have an off switch. And it took me until I was about 30 years old to learn about this. We have an off switch, just like we have a fight or flight system that has kept our ancestors alive. We have an off switch. It's called the vagus nerve. It is the longest nerve in our body. It goes from the back of our skull into our face, down our spine, into our guts. It is the rest or digest button. And we trigger it by taking deep breaths. Because think about it, if you're running from a tiger, you do not have time to go, right? Your body knows if you can take three to six deep breaths like we just did, it knows I am safe. And so it's gonna stop producing cortisol. It is going to give you a spike of dopamine, which is what gives you that nice calm, tingly feeling. It's going to lower your blood pressure and it's going to lower your heart rate, therefore making it easier for you to make decisions. This trick works with anybody. I have a, a godson who happens to have autism uh, and we were evacuated together when he was two um, during Harvey. So kid with autism during a natural disaster, extraordinarily intense situation. But as soon as I was able to look at him and say, hey, can you breathe in when I breathe in and exhale when I exhale? As soon as we could do that three times, we had a different kid on our hands. So it's important for us to know this. It's important for us to show this to others as much as possible, especially given the kind of high level of stress we're in right now. Wherever we can share this with others, the better. And again, this works with anybody, it works with kids, it works with spouses. Take a couple of those deep breaths and it's gonna be a lot easier for you to connect. Now, we understand the high intensity level of stress that we're in right now. So what I wanna do is I want to create a little bit of an emergency self-care. Before we were talking about a, a goal that we're gonna work on towards 30 days. This is for those moments when you feel like you're about to snap, right? These are about really building those in that connection. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds to think to the answers of these questions. And I would like it very much if you could write those down in a place where you will find them, whether it's your wallet, your phone, uh, next to your desk. I want to think about these things because these are things that help us reconnect. So when we're thinking about this, like, for example, one thing you can do in, in 30 seconds, something I can do is I can take deep breaths. <sighs> right? Uh, what is one thing that makes me laugh? There is a 
video on YouTube called Bucket of Sloths. And it's in fact a bucket of sloths and it is adorable to the point that my husband has a bookmark on his phone and any time that I'm getting a little upset, he just clicks it and it works because it makes me laugh every single time. Um, an accomplishment that I'm incredibly proud of, I will always be proud of the work that we did post Harvey, not only educating uh, people in the greater Houston area, but we were able to go to Puerto Rico and share that with them as well. And I, I think I'll be able to retire off that one. I'll, I'll be proud of that until the day I die, probably. And the person who I can always connect with is my husband, um, which works out because we're quarantined together, but it also helps um, that we've known each other for a very long time. And um, I can always talk to him when I am upset, but it's so important for us to be reminded of this, of who's that person I can connect with. Who's, there are things that I am proud of. There are things that I've accomplished. There are things that I have gotten through in the past. And it's important when we're having these difficult times to be reminded of that. Um, another thing that we can do to help our mental health and support is we have started creating these mental health screenings. And these are our ways to make sure that we're, we're really pushing for the conversation about mental health and wellness in the greater Houston area. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this, please check out our website at mhahouston.org. Um, this website not only has toolkits to be able to talk about mental health, but we also have these screening tools. These are ways to really be able to start having a conversation about mental health, whether it's with a doctor, a therapist, or a family member. Um, these are really great tools. And again, they're free, they're confidential, they're anonymous. Now I am gonna go ahead and open it up to questions, but before I do that, I am going to copy paste um, our evaluation link in the chat. Um, as I do that, and you guys take a couple of minutes to fill out the evaluation, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but until then, I really do wanna uh, point out the importance of the evaluation because we ask for evaluations for a couple of reasons. Um, one, and very important, of course, is that we, uh, we need to be able to prove to our funders that we are doing what we say we do, that we are training people and that it is having a positive effect on our community. Um, two, very important to me, I love what I do. I cannot believe I get paid to do it. And the only way I get better at doing it is by reading my feedback. I actually do take it very seriously. And I really do appreciate it when people do give me evaluations. Um, so there is the evaluation link in the chat. And I'm also putting our website uh, for further resources in the chat as well. Um, so if anybody has any questions for me, I would love to open it up to you guys. I've given you a lot of information in a short amount of time. And I want to make sure um, that I answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, so we are a small group. If you would like to unmute yourself to ask your question, you can definitely do that. I know sometimes it's hard to get everything down in the chat quick enough. Um, so you can use the chat or you can unmute yourself. If you would like to stay anonymous, you can send your questions privately to Lauren um, or myself and I will ask the question for you. But to get started, <clears throat> I do have um, a question. So what are some other things that we can do to practice mindfulness? Sure, absolutely. So there are so many wonderful um, apps. There are so many guided meditations that are free of charge. Um, you know, there are so many different resources to learn more about mindfulness. Um, personally, I use Calm. Um, and that, um, it's, it's an app that has guided meditation. It has, um, uh, more loose meditation. So it's just, it's just noise. It also has sleep stories. If you're having trouble sleeping, um, that's something that I use, but I also have heard wonderful things about headspace. I've heard great things and I've used free guided meditations as well. Um, the person who kind of exposed me to mindfulness is Dr. Ann Friedman, and I'll go ahead and put her. Um, and she is with Mindful Being Houston. And 
they do a great amount of work. They're doing virtual classes as well. Um, and so they are a great way to be um, exposed to more information about mindfulness as well. Awesome. Um, another question that I had um, goes back to talking about burnout. I know we talked about um, self-care and you mentioned some things that both employers and employees could do um, to help around burnout. Do you have any um, other specific tips for maybe how employees could approach their employers if they're feeling burnt out? So I think the important thing to do is one, being, being honest and being very expressive and communicative of, listen, I have been, I have been feeling this way at work uh, for this long, and these are things that can be helping with it. Um, I think going into it with that kind of equation of this has been happening for X amount of time, here's how I think it can get better. Um, whether it's burnout or whether whatever the problem is with a supervisor. Um, I know in my personal experience, whenever you go to a supervisor with solutions, um, that is always going to be helpful. Um, so ex um, specific to burnout, if I were burnout at my job, I would go to my supervisor, I would say, hey, I've been feeling cynical at work. I have been feeling unmotivated. Um, I think, uh, and these are symptoms of burnout. I, one, am going to take a little bit of PTO and, and recharge, but I'm also, I would like to talk to you about how can we balance the workload? Um, how can we talk to the team about making sure we all have equal responsibility? Um, how can we talk to the higher ups about potentially loosening up deadlines if need be? You know, um, all of those different things are, are need to be available to have a conversation about. Obviously, we have deadlines that are set in stone, like specifically to us, we have funders, things of that nature. But I think, especially in this year, as much grace and as much humanity as we can express to each other, we need to. Um, and so a lot of that is going to be up to us to communicate, but it's also going to be up to us to advocate and say, hey, I need this, and this is how I suggest we move forward. That is a great suggestion. Um, I know sometimes it can be hard to um, approach a supervisor and, and have these conversations, especially if you are in a busy time um, at work. I know luckily um, this year, my supervisors have been very understanding because it is difficult um, mm. to work from home. And um, so I've had to learn how to be very honest about what I'm feeling and where I am my head spaces, um, but also there have been other things that I've had to start incorporating, like not having my Outlook pop up on my phone every time I get an email um, or setting specific work hours for myself and trying not to work outside of those hours because it, when everything is one space, uh -huh. um, it can be very difficult. Absolutely. Um, can you briefly discuss some of the other programs or trainings that you offer? Sure. Um, so again, Mental Health America, we're one of the longest serving education and advocacy organizations for mental health in the greater Houston area. And we have many different initiatives. We work in school behavioral health. We have the Center for School Behavioral Health um, that really works to improve mental health in schools. Um, so we, um, we educate educators, parents, and students about mental health, suicide prevention, and trauma. Um, then we also have an integrated healthcare initiative where we work to improve integrated healthcare. So connecting physical health with behavioral health and working on the policies to do that more efficiently. Um, then we have a veterans behavioral healthcare team uh, working with justice involved veterans and making sure that those veterans um, who have served our country are getting the services and treatment that they need to move forward in life. Um, and then we have basic mental health literacy. So that breaks down to suicide prevention, trauma 101, and just basic education about that. We're also um, talking about um, burnout, self-care, and all of those different areas. We're also talking about just basic mental health. Um, and we're also constantly adding new things and uh, specific to specific groups as well. Um, so there's a... Um, 
for example, mental health of say real estate agents, understanding different mental health challenges of, of somebody who might be getting evicted or somebody who might be having to sell a home due to um, a loss of a loved one and things of that nature. Making sure that we really understand different facets of, of what could be going on and how to really help people. Um, but we, we have a, a cadre of, of basic presentations and we're always willing to tailor presentations for our audience. Um, and if there's a topic we don't have, reach out to us. We're always interested in learning more um, and, really, and really expanding that reach. So we're, we're happy to, to research new topics as well. Awesome, thank you so much. I know um, our participants here today, I, I encourage them to go to your website and look at some of those trainings that you offer. I know um, whenever I was meeting to set this whole thing up, I was like, well, I don't know, I feel like a lot of these topics could be really um, helpful at Absolutely. this time. And so I guess a more fun question that I have for you, we talked about some ways that we could practice self-care. Um, and you mentioned that self-care, unfortunately, is not just about massages and bubble baths, um, although, you know, some of those things do help us relax. Um, but you talked about the importance of healthy eating, um, getting enough sleep, getting some physical activity and moving mm -hmm. your body. What are um, some of the things that you do personally to practice self-care, if you don't mind me asking? Sure. Um, so I, I try to keep it as multifaceted as possible because, you know, some days you need different things. Um, so I box. I, I, that is the activity that I do against a heavy bag, not a person. Um, that I discovered that I don't like yoga, but I do like boxing. And you know what? That works for me. Um, but then I also have creative pursuits. I like to write. And then just honestly playing with a toddler can be really great self-care. Um, you know, of just like really connecting and, and being very mindful when I connect of like making sure that my energy is very much into playing um, and having that, that social emotional connection is really important. Um, but I'm never gonna turn down that great British baking show and, and just vegging out on my couch. I think that is a fine form of self-care as well. Um, so it's, it's all about moderation and mo including moderation. Find that thing you like to do um, that's going to make you feel happy. Uh, those are awesome. Um, I think um, I have tried to add in a bunch of different things as well and not just rely on one single thing because that's not going to work um, right. in every situation. And over these last couple of months, I've had to try new things. I have not tried boxing yet, um, but that does sound pretty fun. It um, is. <laughs> yeah, there, that, that sounds actually pretty fun and that's probably something that I should try next, so. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great fun. Um, you know, there are places, I think title boxing, it, it still has classes and things like that. I have my own setup, but, um, and if you get into it, it makes a lot of sense to do that, but. Um, it can be really good for, for figuring out ways to work through aggression in a very mindful and healthy way. That is perfect. Okay, so if anyone else has any questions, last minute questions, definitely feel free to add those into the chat or you can unmute yourself. If you are like me and you sometimes think of a question days after a presentation, please feel free to email us at healtheducator at thewomensfund.org and we will work to get a response for your question. Or if you just have comments um, or if you have suggestions for us, we would love to hear those. I'm also going to encourage you to take our survey for this presentation. Let us know what you liked, um, what topics you would like to hear about next time potentially. Um, if you do take the survey, you will be entered to win a gift certificate. Um, I will be sending the survey link in a follow-up email so you will have access to that survey link. Um, our upcoming presentations, this is what we have on our calendar for the rest of the year. So we will be talking about sleep hygiene tomorrow. Um, a really big part of self-care is sleep. So if you're interested in learning more about things that you can do to improve your sleep or the importance of sleep for your body, tune into that. Um, next week we have presentations over germs and self-care. 
So those are also um, really, really important topics, especially right now, if you're interested in those presentations. I encourage you to visit our website, thewomensfund.org, where you can find all of our upcoming events, our publications, um, and also follow us on our social media sites as well. We post regularly about upcoming events. So if no one else has any questions, I do wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, Lauren, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Nothing but um, great comments. Um, my sister is actually on the presentation and um, she told me this is my favorite presentation that you all have done so oh, far. Yay. Yes. I'm so okay. happy to hear that. Thank you. Alrighty, everyone. Well, thank you for coming and have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.